Thanks for listening. This interview is part of an ongoing series of free bilingual digital resources we publish on our website, linked below. Each month, you can learn about a new topic related to community resilience, climate action, or both. This month, we sat down with Scott Runkle, a Ketchum local, to discuss climate action in Blaine County, electrification, and much more. Huge thank you to Scott for making time to provide insight. As a disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Let's jump in. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind for folks who don't know you, just taking a moment to please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Scott Runkle. I am a been teaching at the Sun Valley Community School for 30 years, moved here for the job. I have two children that graduated from the Sun Valley Community School and now are off in the world. I got connected to environmentalism because I spent a lot of time outside mm -hmm. and I just connected with the natural world. And I, you know, when I got home from school, I would put my play clothes on and then be gone until my parents rang the bell for me yeah. to come home for dinner. And yeah. that was, you know, catching frogs. It was fishing. It was just riding my bike on trails. Like it was just enjoying nature. And then my parents had, we had boats. So we'd spend a lot of time out on the, on, on the, the bays and oceans. And I just, fell in love with the natural world and then as I started getting older and I started learning about some of the challenges that the natural world was facing originally yeah. it was through like I was one of those people that would watch the PBS Nova documentaries I on love those mountain gorillas yeah. and you know rainforests yeah. and whales and I was at the end of every one of those they were like had that 10 minutes of like somber news yeah. about what was happening to those populations or those mm -hmm. ecosystems. And so then I, that kind of got me tuned in like, oh, I love this and I want to protect it. Mm -hmm. you know, so that was my, that, that was how it started. And then as I, and then I kind of got into this thing like, well, and I don't know why, but I always felt like, oh, I should, if I believe in this, I should try to live my life as much as I can in line with that. So I would... And I also like doing it. You know, it's easier when you enjoy it. I like biking, so I would bike mm -hmm. everywhere. We only had one car, so I would carpool. Yeah. I just like, you know, it just made sense. And then and then I um, decided, you know, that's that's all great. But if I'm really going to make a difference, mm -hmm. we have to change systems and do have bigger changes, work at the government level. So then that kind yeah. of got me into kind of some more activism kind of work. We're trying to say, hey, like, I can use some of my free time help move policy forward yeah so that's kind of where I got got from where I was to where I am right yeah. now. yeah thank you and that yeah. kind of leads me into the next question which is how are you involved in environmental or climate action um, in your life now so you mentioned 5p can and climate action right. coalition but right. would you mind maybe expanding a little bit on that for folks who aren't familiar with that work yeah so the Climate Action Coalition started probably four or five years ago now, and it was just a, started when Elizabeth Jeffrey emailed me and a few other people saying, you know, she was losing sleep over some of what she's been, what she knows about climate and where, what's happening, and she wanted to see if there was people that wanted to get together and try to do something more. Mm -hmm. And then that led into us having a public meeting and inviting more people in and growing the organization and then brainstorming and trying to figure out hey, what can we do to make a difference. And that led to the clean energy resolution. We work with the Sierra Club and Conservation Voters of Idaho to create a clean energy resolution and get the cities and the county to adopt. And that ultimately had a big part in getting 5B canned off the ground because part of that required, if you're gonna set clean a clean energy goal, um, you need someone who's going to oversee that process. And that yeah. was where kind of that position came from. So those were like kind of that. And then, you know, we've, the organization's done lots of other things with promoting yeah. Earth Days mm -hmm. and um, smaller actions um, as well. And now we're, and you probably maybe have a question about this later, about electrification, which is yeah. one of the things that the organization is working on right now. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I do that. And then I also, in school, I'm the sustainability director of our school. And I try to, 
encourage our school to adopt policies that also have positive environmental impacts and improve our or reduce our impact because it's hard like I remember there was there's this famous um, author Will McDonough I think his name is I think mm -hmm. he wrote the book Cradle to Cradle but he always mm -hmm. talked about it's time not to do less bad but more good mm -hmm. and it's really hard to not do less bad and yeah. as much as I want to do more good it's it's you know I feel like most of what happens in our world is we're just doing things incrementally less bad yeah and not doing things that are making the world more sustainable and healthy mm -hmm. and improving the ecosystems but ultimately that's yeah. where we need to go totally because it's an it's there's not you know there's so much written about the the finite nature of so much of our earth whether it's the mm -hmm. The, the resources and you know the ability of the atmosphere to absorb carbon dioxide. There's yeah. only a finite amount that it can process, and there's right. only a finite amount of fish in the ocean. There's only a finite amount of nitrogen that can be absorbed by ecosystems before it starts having negative effects. And mm -hmm. so we need to start being positive. Yeah, you know, and that's ultimately I think the goal. But you can't. I think one of the things that I've learned is that as much as I like to flip a switch to get there, you mm -hmm. can't get there without doing the small things yeah. to make the change that leads to that point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I really appreciate, too, one of the reasons I wanted to interview you for this piece is because I feel like while policy is super important for everyone in our communities mm -hmm. who are impacted by that, I feel like sometimes the power of policies in schools is overlooked. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, if we can get kids excited and youth excited about the possibilities of climate action, that makes such a huge impact because those eight-year-olds who are, you know, learning about recycling right. or pollinating habitats in, what would they be, second grade? Mm -hmm. They're voting Probably. in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, and right. that's actually not that yeah. long, yeah. you know? Um, and that's why, like, every time there's a new candidate running for city council, almost invariably when you talk to them, they prioritize sustainability, environmental sustainability. Yeah. Like, it's just youth have been confronted their whole life with these problems to totally. see the future and mm -hmm. want to recognize that we need to do things differently. Yeah. Um, and then you briefly mentioned it, but you're a co-leader on the Clean Energy Task Force, mm -hmm. right? That's yeah. the right one. Yeah. That I'm also on with you. Oh, yes. <laughs> we have a meeting next week. Yeah, yeah, we have a meeting next um, week. But would you mind so saying a little bit more? the following week, right? Something next oh, yeah, week. the week after that. Yeah. Um, would you mind saying a little bit more about 5B CAN? And yeah, I mean, 5B CAN has um, taken that, I mean, especially our aspect. I think the 5B CAN is looking holistically at sustainability. So mm -hmm. there's all different, I think there's five different areas from circular economy to, and the one that I've been focused on is green building and clean energy and green building. And green building. And so each group has, there was, there's been lots of meetings and we've engaged, um, trying to engage as many stakeholders as possible to come up with goals, which we have, and then tactics to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. So like an example in ours is, to reduce the energy consumption of existing buildings by a certain percent by 2030. Mm -hmm. And then we've come up with, we're in the process now of approving, we have tactics to get there and then figuring out which tactics we are going to start with and who are the partners that we're going to work with to mm -hmm. try to get those tactics. So like one tactic under that is to make sure that um, there are, contractors educated in the um, skills needed to right. install the new technology that's mm -hmm. going to get make these buildings more efficient yeah and right now that's a big hurdle because people generally know the old technology and are right not and often discouraged like I was just this I mean, I was true story where I was like oh I want to I want a heat pump hot water heater so I called the local contractor yeah and they were like what you want to take your gas you want to replace your gas unit with an electric one Mm -hmm. And they couldn't believe it. 
And yeah. they were like talking among themselves that I had to show them that what I want. He said, this is three times more efficient than the gas one. Yeah. And they were like, as they were leaving, they were like, I've never had someone wow. want to go from gas to electric. Interesting. And it's just like, because they, though they could do it, it wasn't like they couldn't do it. It just was like so foreign to them. And right. if I, it made me feel like, wait, am I doing the right thing? Even yeah. though I've researched this a lot. Yeah. Okay. So I just think that that's just one example. Right. Of like some of the hurdles and then our organization is trying to address those. So that, and the, the idea, which I'm excited for, is pretty relatively soon, within the next month or so, I think by mm -hmm. the beginning of the year, there should be yep. a plan yep. that gets then adopted that will be presented to all the cities, and the cities will hopefully adopt it and then figure out how they can um, put their resources towards achieving it. Yeah, which is so exciting. Yeah, which is like what this yeah. process. Yeah. And there was a quote which I love that someone it's um someone I don't know who told me this quote recently but it's by eisenheiser eisenhower which is pl planning is essential but plans are useless yeah and it's such a great quote because like we're doing all <laughs> this work which is super important to do but ultimately yeah. things are going to change and we're going to have to adapt but if you totally. don't do the planning you're never going to get right where we need to be yeah you have to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. And yeah. if you don't plan, you just do everything. You just mm -hmm. keep doing things the way you just keep like getting blown with the wind. Right. You know, and don't have. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. anyway, this is all really important. It's been a slow process, but a necessary one. And I'm excited to get to that next stage where yeah. programs start getting implemented. To, to, to. Yeah. Um, and I realized I should say that 5B can, so it's not so jargony for people. Yeah. It stands for 5B Climate Action Now. Oh, yeah. well, so for anyone who's yeah, yeah. not <laughs> familiar. Yeah, yeah, it's great that you know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I wouldn't have been able to yeah. pull that out. Yeah. It's good. Um, so why is electrification important for our climate future? Yeah, so there's two, you know, if we're going to reduce, get our emissions to ultimately zero, mm -hmm. we need to both have a clean electric grid, mm -hmm. but also need to then transition our life to electric yeah so if we just clean the electric grid but then right now about 50 percent of our emissions in the county when they did the inventory from mm -hmm. from from homes is gas wow so from the hot water heaters and the heating of mm -hmm. the house mainly um, and but also gas stoves so we need to do both. We need to clean the grid, and Idaho Power is committed to doing that. Maybe mm -hmm. not as fast as we like, but they say by 2045 their grid will be clean. Yeah. And then we need to transition over to electric. Um, and so that's the key. Is and then and then at the same time these new technologies are just more efficient. Right. So putting in an electric gas hot water heater, as I said, is uses three a third the electricity than a gas one. Okay. And that wasn't the case. Right. Not that long ago, but with this mm -hmm. new heat pump technology where they're removing um, heat from the air and using that to heat the water, it's, it is more efficient. Yeah. And there's also the other thing that's now that makes it more attractive is there's lots of federal money because of the Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. that will assist. So like a heat pump hot water heater, there's up to $2,000. Wow. You can get off the price. It's like 30% of the cost. Wow. So, which is, you know, that's it makes something that I go, what I'm finding is, just in the research I've done, it is definitely more expensive because you have to get electric to your, wherever right. you're putting your hot water heater. There has to be a, uh, a drain because as you take the heat out of the air, it cools down and then water. Yep. comes out so you have to be able to drain so you have to put in some work that mm -hmm. will only need to be done one time yeah to do that so it just costs more yeah. so having money available and there's also like it's exciting there's this it's not in place yet and I don't know but there's a, a whole lot of money for people who are low income mm -hmm. for f like up to fourteen thousand dollars of electrification and weatherization improvements wow will be free okay at the point of sale mm-hmm very cool. So like that's that's going to be unfolding too. So because a lot of times these things are like for people like not everyone can accept access yeah. it because it, there's an upfront cost. So, mm -hmm. so I think it has this where a lot, hopefully more as, as this unfolds, more people get excited about it. This money starts trickling through and then it can be adopted widely. Mm -hmm. And it definitely needs to happen if we're going to read our, read right. our climate goals. Yeah. 
So you're doing great. You keep alluding to the next question okay. before I okay. get there. But my next question had to do with, yeah, cost accessibility yeah. of switching to electric appliances yeah. or switching to even an electric vehicle. Yeah. And it sounds like there are, I know there are programs out there that make it more financially accessible to folks. Um, so if people are able to make those swaps um, and they're you know excited about it and willing to do it, what are some other examples of other appliances or behavioral right. changes besides, right. I know you've mentioned heat pumps. Right. But. So like the, you can on, you can get up to $1,200 off your taxes a year f by in weatherization. Okay. So insulating, um, uh, I think ceiling doors and windows. Yeah. So like you can just, you could do it yourself and mm -hmm. then you can deduct that off your taxes or you can have someone come in and, and do it for you. So that's, that's one simple and it has a very, you know, it, you get, get the money back. So right. it's like really accessible and, and good to do. Um, you just, you, um, you have hot water heaters, which generally have a pretty quick payback. And like, there's a, I don't know if, do you have a question in there about, do you know what canopy climate is? is yeah. That, yeah. Is there a question in there about that or is that? There's not, but we can talk about okay, it because yeah. I was in that meeting with you. Oh, okay, okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So there's like, there's a uh, heat pump hot water heaters, which, you know, they're depending on the age of it and mm -hmm. uh, it, some of them make more financial sense to do now, but there's the, the, the thing that's available right now is if you have a ta if you're filing taxes, mm -hmm. you can just kind of like we like with solar panels, like you get 30% off your taxes. So right. you just get that money back in your taxes. So if yeah. you, you know, so they'll, the federal government will pay you that 30% right. on your taxes. So that money is available right now. And then Idaho power has some rebates as well. Mm -hmm. So like you, if you're going to buy a programmable thermostat, they will give you a rebate on that programmable okay. thermostat. Or if you're going to, there's some other, other electrification, um, so I don't have them on the top of my head, but if you come to the meeting, yeah, um, like that will this for you know the but the canopy climate, which which I which I was just alluding to there mm -hmm. is this this program that you can enter your data about mm -hmm. your home, yes, and your and then it will pump out possible cost effective solutions to for you to electrify, yeah, and then they will not only do that, they will give you, they'll be like a buyer's guide and they'll ask you questions that will help you then narrow down what might be the right solution for you. Mm -hmm. And then they can help you find um, contractors in your area because they have a database that we're actually working with them to help populate that with okay. contractors who we know have done this work. Mm -hmm. And then if you get a quote from a contractor, you can then submit it to them and then they will give you feedback as to whether that quote is reasonable based on what they know. Wow. So it's like this really powerful platform cool. that will um, allow people to kind of sift through all the, the noise that makes yeah. doing being an early adopter challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, amazing. So uh, early yeah. adopters unite. Yeah, early, yeah, <laughs> early adopters. And like this, the meeting that with the panel discussion we're have is going to be with a expert in kind of efficiency mm -hmm. and, and John Reuter. Yeah. And then will be three pan and also who built a net zero home okay. with all electric. And then we have three panelists who one who just electrified his entire house and mm -hmm. improved its efficiency. One person who just put in a heat pump HVAC system, electric HVAC oh, system. Okay. Like, cool. Just did that like within the last two months mm -hmm. and then another person who has been over the last years electrifying their house um, so those four panelists have a wealth of expertise there cool and then we'll also be um, taking people emails who want to get signed up for canopy we'll briefly introduce it and mm -hmm. then we'll send them we'll, we'll sign them up and then we, cool. we sign them up it's nice because then we can get them in our network right and then when they make changes we can see those changes and track Okay. Um, yeah, because correct me if I'm wrong, but Canopy also, if you're all signed up within the same community, it will aggregate that data exactly. and show changes over time. Exactly. Yeah. So right so now cool. we have a leaderboard and there's mm -hmm. two of our Climate Action Coalition like team has done things and okay. they're on the leaderboard, but no yeah. one else, there's no one else on there. Not yet. So, but as the idea yeah. is that 
we're going to get people at this meeting. They're going to get excited about electrification. They're going to get signed up for Canopy. Mm -hmm. You can even get on the Canopy, which is cool, which I did this, is you can get a 30-minute consult. Oh, cool. Where you'll actually not just interface with a computer, but talk to mm -hmm. a, a real person. And which then they is put a rare these days. We're totally rare. <laughs> and then uh, they... Um, so, and then so hopefully I'm excited so that in phase two of it, we'll mm -hmm. have another meeting where we bring in contractors okay, and some of wow. the technology so people awesome. can have, okay, this is what I want to do. And then they can come and talk to people who mm -hmm. actually do it Yeah, and then hopefully set up, you know, meeting times, you know, mm -hmm. visit times and they can, we can kind of move this to from actual idea to, yeah, cool. Going through. So that's the vision. Yeah. And we'll eventually the, uh recording of the talk will be out on the library website or YouTube. So we'll link it okay, to cool. this resource so people can oh, cool. find it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two more questions, yeah. for, unless something else fun pops up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, one question is for folks who do not own their homes in the Valley, because I think that that is a lot yeah, of people. Totally. I'm an example of of that I am lucky my landlords are I know them well and they're fantastic um so if people you know don't know their landlords as well or they're in a renting situation what are some behavioral changes they can make um yeah. to help support the grid or be more climate friendly day yeah. to day yeah you know that's like what we've talked a lot about this about like well what if what if renters show up yeah and how do you get them excited about this or get them engaged in this and you know there's always the car yeah so you can always buy uh, an electric car and canopy has actually a great resource for a, they have a great buying guide and, mm -hmm. it, and it can be you know they have plug-in plug-in hybrids or mm -hmm. just all electric um, so that that's one thing i think everyone can do and then there's the idea if you know your landlords well and you have a say, you can encourage them. Yeah. Like educate them and say, hey, you can be involved in this too. You mm -hmm. know, and, and and I think one of the things that I, I think that everyone should be aware of is the impact that gas stoves have on indoor air quality. Yeah. And so one thing that you can do as a like a, a, a renter is just buy like an induction cooktop burner. Yeah. And that's like, you know, for less than $100, you mm -hmm. can get this amazing piece of technology that uh i we got one for our house because we have a gas stove and yeah i'm like i love it it's yeah like made my life better that's so cool and then you know again and then it just comes down to like you know i, I if i said the most impactful thing to do mm -hmm. is get involved talk about climate and yeah. these issues go to city council meetings mm -hmm. vote yep like, like I, I i heard a really interesting podcast where there was it was this discussion about whether individual action matters yeah and basically for most people unless you're the one percent right who are flying all over the place and mm -hmm. like you know have a really large carbon footprint you are just a rounding error on the overall yeah carbon emissions but if you're if you like so if you're in your house and you're turning off your lights when you're not in a room right you shouldn't feel that good about that <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you should do you it, should but do you it. don't feel like that's like, <laughs> right. and I also, but if you are doing things that are then leading to change beyond you, right. so you're like educating your family and friends mm -hmm. that, Hey, I always turn my lights off. This is why I do it. Mm -hmm. And then they start turning their lights off. Yeah. The and then all of a sudden it, it has an impact. Yeah. But you know, so I think it's just like action, individual action is important, but it's got to lead to more individual action mm -hmm. and the only way that can do that is if you're out there talking about it and being and sometimes yeah. it's just like oh i'm gonna even like taking the bus like that is a public action people totally. see you taking the bus and they can yeah you know mm -hmm. see that so that that's i don't know if that answered my question yeah. your question well I mean, no i think that's a great answer and you know we're approaching voting day soon here yeah um but yeah i think that the the activism piece is yeah. is really important for for to to talk about because totally. that's one way to make the impact exponential and um, and if we get policies through the door and um, you know in our community then 
it, that's definitely helps incentivize people. If right. you have to do it, then more people will do it. Exactly. Yeah. I think policy is the, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's this trade off. Like you're not going to get policy until the politicians think the people want it. Right. Yeah. So the people have to like do things to show that they want mm -hmm. it. Which is like, oh, if we want more bus service, people have to ride the bus. Right. If we want, um, if 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 they think it's important that we power the elect our elect get our electricity from renewable sources, people are going to have to care because that that may have a budgetary impact. Mm -hmm. if, if Haley says, oh, we're going to buy all as Idaho Power revamps their clean their green power plan, there's going to be a way to actually buy clean electricity from. A, their renewable plants, and if, as they get more people interested, they'll build mm -hmm. more renewable plants. Right. Yeah. So, but but that's a cost. There's mm -hmm. going to be, and people have to say, "Hey, that's worth it." Right. They yeah. have to be convinced that it's worth it. Yeah. By enough people. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and I do hear from some politicians wishing that there were more people, more citizens coming to the meetings. Mm, locally, so, you hear locally. that. Locally, lot and catch them. Yeah. Like, go to your planning and yeah, zoning yeah, yeah. meetings. Go to those meetings. Go to the city council when there's things. And just, yeah. you know, just get up at the front and say, this is this is mm -hmm. important. Yeah. And we should be prioritizing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to shout out Courtney Hamilton because I think that she does a good job. Yeah. I think Courtney's does a great job. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, and I think, yeah, I think there's like Ketchum. Ketchum has led the way in the financial side of things and also mm -hmm. some of the policies i know they've been stymied a lot by the state of idaho yeah and their yeah their insistence that we can't exceed their any building codes that right. they do and stuff but mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah for sure uh steps in the right direction yeah total, yeah. total steps yeah. in the right direction so um zooming out a little bit for the next question and this is the last question i have prepared um i was talking to somebody recently who is an engineer with an electric vehicle company. I don't know where or which one, but he helps engineer electric vehicles. And he was talking about how, while electric vehicles are great because they help support, you know, a decrease in reliance on fossil fuels, there are also a lot of really impact heavy extraction methods mm -hmm. and resources that go into making electric vehicles. And so a point that he brought up is that electric vehicles are great. And if we're able to put the infrastructure in to charge them throughout the country or even, you know, right. Blaine County or Idaho, and everybody who owns a regular car now swaps it for an electric vehicle, that's still a huge impact mm -hmm. on the planet. Yeah. So an example that he mentioned was, Maybe what we should be investing more time and energy and, you know, monetary resources into is a really efficient, uh, kind of robust electric train system <laughs> so that fewer totally, people yeah. own cars oh, yeah. and our individual impacts yeah. are fewer. So that's kind of an anecdotal example for yeah. the question. But the question is, what are some systems or structures you think we could change in the valley? Um, that would help incentivize people to change that, you know, to lessen that individual right. impact. Yeah, like, well, I think one example that's going to come up soon now is there's a plan to expand the highway to four lanes. Totally. From south of Bellevue all the way to Ketchum. Yep. And if you do that and don't put any incentives in there to for carpooling and mm -hmm. buses, all you're going to do is get more cars. There's there are studies that prove that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal did so, an right. article about that. So you know, I would be if I was in charge, I would be like, okay, yeah, we, maybe we need that. Maybe that's the reality is that mm -hmm. if we're going to get the number of people, but I would have make the one of the lanes a carpool bus lane. Yeah. And therefore, people who can stay in this lane and go as whatever that is, and this lane mm -hmm. is always going to be moving. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like those are the kind of things like we need to incentivize the right behavior, right? And not, I mean, I, I mean, in a perfect world, I would love a bus or train system, mm -hmm. like a train system, like that would be cool, yeah. like 
but, but I also know that's cost cost like crazy expensive yeah. to to do. Right. And where are you going to put it? We're not going to reclaim the bike path. Like right. I don't think that's mm -hmm. feasible. So that would be. To me, that would be like like right in the top of my mind is like it's going to kill me if we build a four lane highway mm -hmm. and now we have more elk or wildlife issues because yeah. there's no way for them to get across now. Yeah, we have more. Um, we do. We're going to get the same amount of traffic. It's going to be you know. I just mm -hmm. think just think about like it also like I don't know if you're listening to the podcast Strong Towns. No, it's a really good podcast. Okay, I'll look that up. It's a movement to try to reclaim. It's the a strong town is a town where everything was is everything you need is within fifteen minutes of where you live, bike or walk. Wow, like okay, that's the that's the idea of a strong town. But they talk about we build roads now to get people through cities, mm. not to be in the city. Yeah. So like as we move, all, Haley gets to be less and less pleasant because all we're doing is moving people through Haley to get them to catch them. Mm -hmm. We should be like affordable house like we should be building more housing in catch in, in the places where people need to live yeah to work and not like that would fix the problem like mm -hmm. to me that's what we should be doing not yep. building more road we should be somehow climate build, friendly affordable housing. right totally <laughs> Cli yeah. and we could do that and all of a sudden like i look at all these people driving well of course they're driving from jerome because that's where yeah. they can afford a house right um but yeah so i feel like that to me would be like a like have like advantage also i think it would make our community better Absolutely. We have this diversity of people living mm -hmm. in there and it's not mm -hmm. just this like vacation second homers or like yeah. retirement. Or, right. Yeah. Becoming more homogenized yeah. in a lot of ways. Right. And there's lots of evidence yeah. to say like Salt Lake has like one of the cities, they have the most opportunity, most percentage of people who go from the lowest economic group to the higher economic group, most social mobility mm -hmm. of any city. Wow, and one of the reasons they they is because of the 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 diversity, right? Like there's less segregation of right. people. More people are connected in that yeah. city, just the way it's. Yeah, I don't know. There's a so anyway. That would be like yeah. I would totally. Do, I think transportation, fixing the housing, right. and not building a new road. If all we're going to do is solve the problems by the way we've always, that right? Have always that have not yeah. worked before, right? And I agree. I mean, the car thing is a huge issue because like, I've read those same things. If we replace all the cars with equivalent cars that are just bad with 300, right. 400 mile batteries, mm -hmm. that environmental impact is going to be equal to the environmental right. impact of the existing cars. So yeah. we need to be sure we need some electric vehicles, but we need improved public transportation and mm -hmm. other initiatives that are going to require mm -hmm. less driving. So we don't have to, we also yeah. need, you know, recycling so that we can reclaim batteries. Yeah so that the car manufacturers right now are already thinking about batteries and right. how they were going to recycle them and reuse them. Right. Thinking, I think that this is one of my qualms with the way we try to solve problems in general, mm -hmm. this kind of inside the box thinking yeah. is we're really focused on, at least from my experience in starting to become in my young adult life, more involved in local politics. And, yeah. um, you know, I work in climate resiliency yeah. and I'm in schools and all these things is, um, so few people are willing to take the time to learn about 10-year projections, right? So, like, mm -hmm. if we keep doing what we're doing now, what does yeah. the world look like in 10 years? What about 20 years? What about 50 years when your kids are your age or whatever? Yeah. Um, and then even fewer people, I feel like, are willing to do what it takes to fix it or yeah. create that really long-term solution. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like a high-speed electric train from twin even or yeah, shown yeah. all the way up through would be really cool yeah that would um, be cool if there was a way but yeah that's if, yeah it seems far like it, does. <laughs> it seems like how are we going to do that I mean, just like we designed our country yeah so spread out right that the cost mm -hmm. of running that i mean we did it at some point we had that rail there yeah and then we ripped it out mm -hmm. 100 years ago <laughs> yeah. but it would be nice to put it back yeah it's it's a hard one i mean there there's a our school has a we have an entrepreneur class mm -hmm. the perspectives are so different totally from the capitalist what can i do to make money yeah versus like well let's think about other things like how are we treating our workers yeah how what's the impact you know what's the the manufacturing impact on the local environment totally you know what's the mm -hmm. you know 
what's that long? And, you know, they, they, they're often not, they don't, you know, yeah. if you run a business, like you're, especially if you have stockholders, you're like oh, required yeah. to make money. Totally. So it's just like our whole system is not, we're, we're fighting against an existing system. So mm -hmm. ultimately, I think that makes it, though I think you have the most, that's why I like local stuff, because you have the most chance to right. make a difference. Make an impact. Some of those bigger, it's harder to do that. Yeah. The costs are in the future of often spread out unequally. Like, oh, yeah, there's a big hurricane here Absolutely. or a drought here. Or, yeah, you just yeah. can't fish Silver Creek as much as we used to because it's too warm in the summer. Mm -hmm. You don't – it's not – Yeah. It's not, you spend $5, you don't get – it might be – it might save the world $1,000 if you send $5, but you don't right. necessarily – get mm -hmm. any of that savings yeah which is why the capitalist system doesn't work right <laughs> for solving environmental problems yeah it's like we have a terrible system right <laughs> yeah the yeah. uh the way that profitability and barriers to entry for entrepreneurs and risk reward the way it's all set up is is tricky yeah yeah i was just unrelated but my advanced chemistry classes i've been really interested in PFAS. I don't know if that name means yeah, anything. Yeah, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've read... Would, would you mind explaining it, though? Yeah, so PFAS are perfluorinated, a class of fluorinated carbon compounds. Mm -hmm. So they basically take carb fluorine and bond it to carbon, and mm -hmm. then they use it as coatings. Yep. So, like, you know, Teflon's the first one that came out, mm -hmm. and it's oil-resistant and water-resistant. So it, And it was used in the military to cover tanks to keep them from rusting, and getting dirty and then they they say oh you can put it on carpeting and they put it on food packaging because it keeps the grease from getting through and so now it's everywhere furniture furniture it's yeah. like it's like it's like everywhere because it's so versatile and cheap mm -hmm. and there's 15,000 different versions of it wow because it's really easy to make okay and because that fluorine carbon bond is so durable mm -hmm. it's they you know they call them forever chemicals right. because they don't degrade very quickly like mm -hmm. their half life is like super long like you know. yeah so i got interested in that i read they did a study where they tested fish samples all across the united states and one meal of freshwater fish was like drinking a month of contaminated tap water oh that's so scary and i was like oh my gosh what about the fish here so i was like oh you know as i always try to do i was like oh, if i can do something in my classes to learn more about this so i came in and I, we, we've been talking about it in my chemistry class and i told them that they we're gonna I always run a research study of some kind, but mm -hmm. usually it's smaller. And I was like, well, we're gonna use the whole two terms and we're gonna decide a question to try to answer about PFOS and then run a research study to try to answer it. So we mm -hmm. narrowed it down to blood, like what's the PFOS levels in people's blood, what's wow. the PFOS level in some water samples, mm -hmm. and or what's the PFOS levels in fish. Right. So those are the three areas, and then we realized that we didn't know enough to decide which one was the best one to do. So the students sent out, there's a podcast, podcast, of course there's a podcast and everything <laughs> yeah. called PFAS something. And I, <laughs> and I had everyone listen to one 30 minute podcast and they wrote yeah. down the names like of people who might be, and then we just cold emailed them all. Wow. And this guy, this guy is Paul Newman from ESC, ESC one or two, some company that does, remediation for PFAS okay. and testing for PFAS. Mm -hmm. Like called this back all excited, like sent an email. It's like, oh, I'd love to help. And then we just, a student and I, a student who sent the email and I, we just talked to him and he was like so excited and he was going to, he's talked to the lab and see if they can give a discount on their testing and he's going to, he's going to zoom with our class next week. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I don't know where I was going with that story, but. Well, I think it's a good illustration of how, you know, something that, everybody is bearing the cost of yeah, yes, can yeah. be impacted by our actions. So if I choose to not purchase products that have that right. PFAS in it or on it or right. as a part of it, yeah. tell everyone right. I know not right. to do it, yeah. then it's less likely to be right. in the water that all of us are drinking. Of course, the, the fatal flaw in all that is yeah. that you don't know. And not only that, companies don't even often know. Really? Because like... Here's like, they, I just like, yeah, the more you learn about this substance, you realize how ubiquitous it is. Some plastic bottle manufacturers realize that if they fluorinated the 
plastic, mm -hmm. it would be more durable because the contents would be less likely to, you know, react with the lining. So they started fluorinating the plastic bottles oh, no. that might have your yogurt or your milk. Wow. And companies don't even know. They just yeah. get the bottle. Yeah. And, you know, and so, like, I think that's the challenge, though the EPA, this was one of the podcasts, they are just coming up with a law that's, that's in the process where manufacturers have to go back 10 years and report um, in their manufacturing of products whether mm -hmm. there's been PFAS in anything they've done. So there's yeah. now going to be mandatory reporting of PFAS, but up until then, up until now, there's, that's like, wild. you call up companies, they will have no idea. They don't know. Unless they're, like, man, like, maybe if they're using it in, yeah. like, like, it's using a lot of industry, to, but, mm -hmm. so, you could try. And yeah. there's some things, like, yeah, you know, scotch, like, though I, like, first of all, I went and I have a, I don't know, you, do you mountain bike at all, or any of you are a biker? Not yet. But I once, this is probably got, like, 15 years ago, I got this grease for my chain that yeah. was non-stick grease. It wasn't, yeah. the idea wasn't going to attract us, and of course, it's, like, Teflon. Yeah. So I've been putting like oh my gosh. Teflon. Right. And you know, you put it on your chain and your chain's in your driveway and then it rains and you're like, you're thinking like all Yikes. this stuff like that you've done. That, yeah. And, and uh, so yeah, it's just everywhere. It's, it's yeah. Like you, you. Yeah. That's why, that's why I like the idea. I thought that cool one about testing kids' blood. Yeah. Just to see like what is our. What, what's in our, what's in there. And then you also, the other challenge is that we have tests for maybe 20 of the 15,000. PFAS. Right. So you can test. You get basically wow. this list of the yeah. most common ones. Right. And you test for those. Yeah. And I'll just use this moment to plug that that's why if it's accessible for you to buy food from farmers you know totally. without all the plastic packaging yeah, totally. is so important because, you know, buying food in glass. Yeah. Because, uh, I know yeah, I yeah, it could be everywhere. I started taking all like I use now glass mason jars for yep. all my containers when yeah. I go to school, I put everything in yeah. mason jars. And then it's reusable and then there's less plastic in the oh, landfill. Totally. Yeah. 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 Great. Anyway, it's always a new thing to think about. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so as a last question maybe, so we're not leaving folks with PFAS everywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Scary. If, you know, somebody could do one climate action, you know, after listening to this or reading this that would, that you would encourage them to do. If you could leave them with one, an invitation to do one thing, what would it be? Well, I mean, the one thing I, which I already said would be to get involved yeah. with your local politics. Okay. That would be the, the, the number one thing. If you're mm -hmm. going to take an action, I think one of the easiest actions you can do that actually has a pretty big impact on your carbon footprint is mm -hmm. the food choices you make. Yeah. So I think like that is... And, I, and, and though there's probably you could find someone who would disagree with it, but I do think there's a wide consensus that the more plants you eat, the healthier you are. And that's also better for the environment. Mm -hmm. So more local. Regional plants. Regional plants. Yeah. Ideally regional plants. <laughs> regional plants. And yeah. uh, so that would be my, yeah. I think that's a pretty easy thing to do. Great. Awesome. Sure. Thanks so much. You're welcome.